traditional lines or Italian hard chine. Flat, planing hull or standard production cruiser. A maxi rated yacht built of glass fibre or aluminium alloy. Will the winner of the third Whitbread round the world race be a well proven swan from Scandinavia designed by Sparkman and Stevens so successful in the previous races? A new Herman Freres design too deep for the Dutch canals or an outsized dinghy from New Zealand. Many yachts have been built specially for the race, making full use of modern advances in technology. Mast sections have become lighter and more flexible and are supported by rod rigging to lessen the stretch. Aboard a maxi rated yacht, all the equipment is on a grand scale. As the spar is stepped through the deck, Vast bottle screws and outsized clevis bolts, specially heat treated, secure the shrouds. And the large headboard has been machined from solid aluminium alloy. Retaping the spreaders and stocking up on Italian pasta are part of the hectic preparations in Gosport before the international fleet of 28 yachts flying the ensigns of 14 different nations set out for the start. Connie van Rietzhouten is one of many familiar faces, back again to take part in another race. And Peter Blake, this time at the helm of his own boat, Ceramco New Zealand, looks set to give some tough competition. Luff grooves with feeders enable a Maxi's huge headsails to be raised more easily as the yachts hoist their sails for the start. As the fleet of boats full of spectators converge off Portsmouth and crowds gather at South Sea Castle, the yachts jockey for the most favourable position behind the starting line in the light southeastern. Tacking the bigger boats requires careful drill and timing, with a need to change the runners. The third Whitbread round the world race organized by the Royal Naval Sailing Association, gets underway as the yachts set out on their 26,000 mile marathon voyage around the world with a light beat to windward out between the forts guarding the Solent to the east of the Isle of Wight. The strong French challenge includes Alain Gabet with Charles Heitzig, Euro Marche behind Lico 43 from Spain and Goloise while Dutchman Connie van Rietzhouten, with his new flyer aimed at line honours, is trying to catch Sir Ramco, who made an excellent start. And Swiss Pierre Failman has a new disc door, designed like Sir Ramco, by Bruce Farr. Spectators from France get an unexpectedly close view as the big yachts navigate through the congested water with the mass of small craft waiting to cheer them on their way. FCF Challenger, the biggest boat, is skippered by Les Williams, taking part in his third Whitbread race. By Bembridge Ledge Boy, the first mark on the course, Flyer is already out in front. The old Penduick 6 has retained her catch rig, but skipper Eric Cavalli has replaced her controversial uranium keel. After rounding the buoy, the freer wind brings the chance to set spinnakers on the shy reach into the channel. Uh, hey, go, go, Pip, go, Pip. In the first Whitbread, winner of the last race is well known for campaigning his yachts with extreme business efficiency and kid in more lead being added to her keel for greater stability. Connie is out to break the race record time. Second is 68-foot Ceramco New Zealand with a light displacement hull, 
Skippered by Peter Blake and Bizarre, like an outsized dinghy with a flat, planing stern, she's already won the tough Sydney Hobart race on both handicap and elapsed time. Her fractional rig with swept back spreaders allows her to carry smaller headsails for greater efficiency with less crew, while a saltwater desalination plant saves the weight of over half a ton of water. Third is Cretair 9, another new Herman Frere's design. Her very experienced skipper, who's taken part in many ocean races with his family as crew, is 60-year-old André Vian. He was third in the first Whitbread race with his schooner Grand Louis. 80-foot FCF Challenger, fourth, is the scratch boat. With a glass fibre hull and fractional rig, she's designed by David Allen Williams and Doug Peterson and skippered by veteran Les Williams. Fifth is Charles Heitzig, a very well-prepared entry from France. Designed by Vatton with low freeboard and sugar scoop stern, she's an attractive yacht with few compromises to luxury. Only skipper Alain Gabet has standing headroom. And sixth is United States entry Alaska Eagle, the old flyer looking a little heavy in contrast to the more modern designs. Last time's winner has undergone extensive alterations, exchanging her catch rig for a sloop. Another former catch, United Friendly, better known as Great Britain II, has had 10 feet added to her mainmast. Owned by Cecilia Unger and skippered by Che Blythe on her fourth voyage around the world, she holds the race record of 134 days. The course is now set for Cape Town, the first port of call, 7,000 nautical miles away. And a daily check of the rigging for signs of wear is one of the many routine tasks as the crew settle down to life at sea. Connie can now relax and enjoy the sailing. Few details can have escaped his meticulous planning from Kevlar ropes for extra strength and lightness to a whole new system of clothing to keep his crew warm and dry. Peter Blake, his chief rival, is on his third Whitbread race and has already logged over 170,000 ocean miles. It takes Kiwi ingenuity to swing out to the leech of the mainsail to replace a damaged batten instead of wasting precious time by dropping the sail. Powerful hydraulic systems are used to control the rig, such as the boom bang, replacing the kicker strap, and the enormous backstay tension. But it still takes real He-Man stuff to tighten the lee shrouds on a maxi. Trimming the spinnaker requires constant vigilance, easing the sheet by hand, and carefully watching the luff for signs of collapse. Flyer's choice of different weight spinnakers for different wind strengths vary from a half ounce gossamer floater to a three ounce chicken shoot for Southern Ocean gales. Will the dark clouds ahead bring too much wind for this spinnaker? Rollers around Flyer's forehatch greatly reduce the enormous effort needed to handle her extensive wardrobe of 25 sails, weighing a total of over three and a half tons. Each sail sausage can be directed down into its own individual bin. Below decks, the long passageway running the whole length of the yacht provides space to allow even the biggest spinnakers to be folded in comparative ease and stored in the bins. All the crew's sleeping accommodation is abaft the mast, well separated from wet sails, and the whole interior has been carefully planned for comfort of the crew. Aboard Ceramco, even the strapped-in cook, busy making the chips, was chosen for his yachting experience, while Flyer's cook is a fully qualified French chef.
Modern, flexible masts, controlled by hydraulics, enable the shape of the sails to be adjusted to suit different wind speeds and points of sailing. But lightweight spars under great stress can be a source of anxiety. Ceramco is racing along in a 25 knot southeasterly after the frustrating calms of the doldrums. Ceramco's dreams lie shattered in a maze of tangled wires. A tiny fracture in the rod rigging as it bent over the lower spreader snapped, breaking the mast in two places. Despite intense disappointment and shock, the crew quickly clear the decks and set up an ingenious jury rig. The top of the broken mast will be set on a breadboard and lashed to the stump, and a bipod mizzen made from two spinnaker poles. When Flyer's crew hear the news of their closest rival, there seems less urgency to press on so hard, although Kreter and Charles Heidsick are well up on handicap. Mylar headsails are an important innovation since the last race. They hold their shape better than terrelene and can be used in a wider range of wind speeds. Ceramco, looking curiously like an Arab dhow with her trisel set as a mizzen staysail, is welcomed from the air by a delighted Pippa Blake, wife of the skipper. Under jury rig, with mainsail with four reefs and a blooper set from the masthead, Ceramco sails over 3,800 miles, at times covering over 230 miles a day, at speeds of up to 15 knots. But the undamaged flyer, having skirted round the South Atlantic High, is well in the lead approaching Cape Town, the traditional tavern of the seas at the tip of South Africa. After the excitements of reaching port, the crews take the chance to have their equipment professionally checked over and carry out vital repairs before the tremendous stress of the Southern Ocean gales. Flyer repairs a keel leak caused by hitting a rock before the race. While Dr. Mogens Boogie from Swedish entry checks over his impressive array of medical equipment. All sails must be carefully checked for frayed seams and worn stitches. Flyer's mast is unstepped and checked nine times between her launching and the end of the race. While Charles Heidsick has a new spar, her mast having been badly sprung from the deck within sight of the finish. Ceramco, La Barca Laboratorio and Roligo have all been dismasted and the majority of the yachts have suffered rigging failures despite moderate winds on the first leg. A crew of 12 can get through a surprising amount of drink and food during the weeks between ports. Some skippers run dry boats at sea, but for those lower down the fleet, beer can be a great consolation. The Germans even refer to it as liquid bread. This time, the maxi yachts are too deep and too numerous to be moored in front of the Royal Cape Yacht Club. At the briefing for skippers and navigators, there's a chance to get up-to-the-minute information on the latest weather predictions for the toughest leg of the race.
Connie van Rietshouten was first into Cape Town, but André Vion has taken the handicap prize for the first leg, just beating a disappointed Anna Gabe. As the yacht set out for the start of the second leg to New Zealand, Pierre Failman is hoping to improve on his fourth place on handicap in the last Whitbread race in a Swan 65. While Charles Heidsieck is hopeful of gaining the handicap lead from Kriter. Sir Ramco has lost all chance of winning the Whitbread trophy, but has a new mask for the second leg. FCF Challenger, the leading British contender, is another fractionally rigged yacht which was slowed by mast damage on the first leg. After the generous hospitality of Cape Town, it's difficult to settle down and face the seven and a half thousand mile voyage to Auckland through some of the world's most inhospitable seas. Saramco is catching up Norwegian Bergi Viking, who made a very good start, skippered by Olympic gold medalist Peder Lundi. Many of the yachts tack close inshore to keep out of the north running tide in the dead beat to the Cape. Connie prefers to start away from the crowd to avoid trouble, but Flyer soon sails through the fleet catching up the leaders. Fifty-eight foot disc door, built in the same yard as Goldwars and Charles Heidsieck, has a fractional rig and powerful flat stern for fast downwind planing in the Southern Ocean. She's about to be put to the test. Alaska Eagle's disappointed crew underrated the opposition from the lighter modern boats like Crete. Sir Ramco meets the swell coming in from the west. For her crew, selected from 140 New Zealand applicants, this leg is an emotional home run to Auckland, and they're determined to fight Flyer all the way to the finishing line. Sir Ramco, like Dis Dor, has been expressly designed for exceptional downwind surfing performance in the huge seas that lie ahead. By sunset at Sentinel Rock, Flyer has taken over the lead from Quito, with Ceramco well inshore, followed by Disc d'Or, Euromarche and Challenger. Steadily dropping temperatures, Alaska Eagle sights her first iceberg at 53 degrees south. Aboard Bergi Viking, the hostile Antarctic weather holds no fears for the hardy Scandinavians. On Swedish entry, a crewman climbs out to the end of the spinnaker pole and works without gloves. The smaller boats tend to go further south to sail a shorter distance, while the larger yachts stay north in the hope of more favourable winds. Swedish entry is skippered on this leg by her Danish doctor. Peter Silverheim has returned home to try and raise more money. But sadly for the crew, their race will end in Auckland. The icebergs, spectacular by day, are a constant menace in the dark, and the yacht has been forced to laugh twice in one night to avoid collisions. The daily chat show between the yachts eases the intense feeling of isolation. And
powerful modern radio receivers enable crews to keep in touch with the rest of the world. Aboard flyer, the boom has broken just behind the hydraulic vang. With the mainsail and spinnaker lowered, and a blast reacher and running jib hoisted instead, flyer continues to surf at over 20 knots. The boom is quickly repaired using a spare outer sleeve carried for the purpose. The proximity of Ceramco is a constant challenge, and they're really racing the boat hour after hour. FCF Challenger's boom snaps in the same place a few days later. The crew improvise repairs with two strips of aluminium bolted through the boom. It'll continue to give trouble for the rest of the leg, breaking several times more and shearing the bolts. Ramco has recorded speeds of up to 34 knots and is handling like a giant dinghy. She too has broken her boom, but managed to effect repairs without dropping the mainsail. Back on Bergi Viking, it's near the end of a watch. Changing helm while surfing down huge waves requires great concentration not to turn a 20 knot surf into a 20 knot brooch in the first few moments of acclimatization. Bergi Viking goes further south than any other yacht having sailed farther east on the first leg. Connie's face shows signs of the acute stress of continuous boat-for-boat -boat racing against Ceramco. Sophisticated electronics make navigation much easier. The multifunction display unit of the Hercules computer gives quick and accurate information on wind speed and wind angle, as well as constant performance measurement, helping Flyer's tactician to set the best possible course in the duel with Ceramco. In the northeasterlies of the Tasman Sea, Peter Blake, using his local knowledge, closes the shore and gets a flatter sea in the shelter of the land. He manages to conceal his exact position and Flyer sails into much rougher, less favorable water. By the tip of North Island, a wind shift to the northwest allows Flyer to catch a favorable tide for the run south, but it's unfavorable for Ceramco. As Flyer gives Cape Brett a wide berth in the freer wind of late evening, all New Zealand is tuning in to radio reports of the yacht's progress. And by the early hours of morning, Flyer sails into Horaki Gulf. Once more, Connie has achieved his ambition to be first on elapsed time and has broken the previous record. But the massive welcome of the home crowds is kept 
for Ceramco. It's the fast number of people around the waterfront. There are cars from all directions right, right around the wrecky wharf, and we've seen some spectacular work by the New Zealanders aboard. They had a little difficulty with the spinnaker about 400 metres back. Now they're powering down at a 10 knot, surrounded by boats in all directions, from an old tug, those little life rafts out here, and they're going across the line right now. The crew takes their arms in the air in jubilation. gathers on Marsden Wharf. Hundreds of Aucklanders have delayed their holidays to see the Boxing Day start. Halfway round the world, Flyer's chances of beating the record time for the race look good, but she's lying third on handicap. While rival Ceramco is well pleased with her handicap win on the second leg, as the fleet, now reduced to 23 yachts, prepare to set out on the 6,000 mile voyage around notorious Cape Horn to Mar del Plata in Argentina. The Prime Minister fires the gun and they're off. With the wind from the south, it's a spinnaker run from the start. Ceramco immediately takes the lead in her home waters, followed by Goloise, Alaska Eagle and Crete. Most crews enjoy the competitive spirit of the starts which bring the only chance to race boat for boat against their rivals before they scatter once more to race unseen across the ocean. United Friendly hoists her spinnaker with a twist, but Alaska Eagle has made a good start. At the halfway stage, Creter is still handicap leader, but has reduced her lead to only seven and a half hours Charles Heidsieck, second on handicap, peels another spinnaker in an effort to catch Crete. Followed by Euromarche. Alaska Eagle. Berge Viking. Zago, United Friendly, FCF Challenger, Disc Dor, and Lico 43. Ceramco delights the Aucklanders by holding onto her lead through the foaming, churned up waters. Against a backdrop of extinct volcano Rangitoto, for Peter Blake and his all New Zealand crew, the exhilaration of leading the big fleet to the downwind turning mark must take away some of the disappointment of their disastrous dismasting on the first leg. Amongst the huge spectator fleet on the water, there's a carnival atmosphere. Thousands of people have taken to their boats, especially to see this great event. South African Zago is well up, but Flyer has made a deliberate late start to avoid trouble. Brian and Joyce Blake wave farewell to their son Peter and his crew as Ceramco races first to the turning mark, where a huge armada of small craft lie in wait. is followed by Golwaz, skippered by Eric Loiseau, Flyer, who's steadily catching up the leaders, and Krita. Charles Heidsieck is next to round the training ship, Spirit of Adventure. Followed by Euromarche, Alaska Eagle, Disc Dor, Bergi Viking, United Friendly, and Challenger. 
Sir Ramco's crew are looking forward to renewing their exciting boat-for-boat -boat match racing with Flyer on the second of the two downwind legs of the race. All Sir Ramco's spinnakers are of identical colours to give nothing away to any following yacht. Enthusiastic spectators continue to cheer their national entry on her way. The course now lies eastward across Horaki Gulf and beyond Great Barrier Island, out over the Bay of Plenty, named by Captain Cook. Very soon the yachts will exchange the warmth of the New Zealand summer for the hardships of the roaring forties once more. Some of FCF Challenger's crew have paid thousands of pounds for the very special experience of sailing around the world, but they seem dogged by bad luck. The port lower intermediate shroud has parted, while Challenger rounded up in a 35 knot wind to retrieve a new spinnaker from the water after the head had blown out. To save the mast, Les had to jibe immediately, causing further damage. Brave crewman goes aloft to attach a spinnaker halyard as a jury stay. Alaska Eagle's problem is less obvious. With a lavish refit that has increased her rating, she's too heavy to be competitive against the modern lighter designs. Her disappointed crew gamely muster the energy to keep her going as fast as they can, comforted by the luxury of hot salt water showers. Trete de Rome, who draws her crew from ten common market countries, has a Greek at the helm, while Antonio Chiotti takes a sunset. The old-fashioned sextant still has its use, alongside sophisticated satellite navigation equipment, giving an instant, reliable position fix. An invaluable aid when you're approaching land. Cape 
Cape Horn, legendary island tip of South America, pointing towards the frozen wastes of Antarctica, produces none of its infamous storms for Flyer and Ceramco, who sail by in sight of each other in a gentle force three. Flyer passes south of the Horn first, having set a new race speed record with a 24-hour run of 327 miles, and Ceramco is only three miles behind. The yachts are greeted by the Chilean and Argentine navies as they pass the famous landmark. Breakfast at Cape Horn for Peter Blake and his crew is a thick sandwich on deck. A wind shift to the northwest allows Ceramco to catch it first, becoming the weather boat while Flyer is still beating against the light northeasterly, and Ceramco, once more, takes the lead. She's held her own against the bigger Flyer in a remarkable 5,000 mile duel all the way from Auckland. Four days out, local weather knowledge allowed the New Zealanders to get 40 miles ahead. It took Flyer several days to catch up, and since then, the yachts have raced neck and neck all the way. <laughs> Alaska Eagles crew keep up their spirits with a rousing party to celebrate rounding Cape Horn. The great advantage of a race sponsored by a brewery is plenty of free beer. In an ever-increasing wind, they have an exhilarating sail within half a mile of the shore, until Cape Horn lives up to its evil reputation and plays its own special brand of party tricks with a series of vicious squalls up to 50 knots. Two brooches and a jive take their toll of one blown-out storm chute, a second ripped to pieces, and a blown-out seam in the mainsail. Meanwhile, Flyer has succeeded again in overtaking Ceramco and is seven hours ahead. She keeps her record for being first into each port to moor in the Argentine submarine base at Mar del Plata. Heidsick arrives hoping for the third leg handicap prize, but strong winds are now favouring the smaller boats. Admiral Charles Williams welcomes the yachts to the Yacht Club Argentina. And gets a cooling shower of champagne. South African catch, Zago, is typical of the boats that excelled in previous Whitbread races. She's no match for the leaders this time, but her crew are delighted to get third place on handicap for the prestigious third leg.
Roaring Forties trophy goes to Ceramco, but little more Bihan, the smallest French boat, has taken the prize for the third leg. While compatriot Charles Heitzig, the new handicap leader, looks set for a private duel with Crete for the Whitbread trophy. Crowds of Argentine holidaymakers line the shore at Mar del Plata as the 24 yacht set out on the final stage of the race back to Portsmouth. FCF Challenger, originally christened Ocean Greyhound, has changed her name to First Cooperative. Skipper Les Williams and his crew must be hoping the change of name will bring a change of fortune. Ceramco's crew are delighted to be back at sea after the long six weeks in port and calm weather brings a chance to sleep off their Argentine experiences. Wonder what he's dreaming of. Richard White makes the tea. With praiseworthy economy, favorable winds, the warm seas and even warmer air bring the most enjoyable sailing conditions of the race. Ceramco has sailed further east than most of the fleet, who are to the north of them, having kept closer inshore. And Flyer is already 200 miles ahead. The crew work hard to keep the yacht going, treating the race as though it were round the boys. While the cook takes the chance to enjoy the sun. Flyer maintains good speed through the doldrums and looks certain to be first boat on elapsed time. But the Whitbread Trophy is awarded to the handicap winner and both Charles Heidsick and Creter started this leg with a lead of nearly four days over Flyer. But if only Ceramco hadn't been dismasted on the first leg, she would have been the certain winner of the trophy. She's now well on her way to taking the prize for the fourth leg. Peter Blake judges the best moment to drop the mainsail to allow the crew to do a rush job re-stitching the batten pockets. With the spinnaker set, the speed has hardly dropped. It's vital they keep close enough to flyer to stay in the same weather pattern. Ceramco's sailmakers have had a remarkably easy time compared with those on other boats. Her easily handled headsails are only half the size of flyers, and she's not had a single sail blowout throughout the entire race. The luckless first cooperative suffers the ninth dismasting of the race, east of the Azores. The mast is broken in three places, in the dark, and the crew were forced to cut the rigging to clear away the wreckage before it damaged the hull. A jury rig is made from the boom, supported by two spinnaker poles, and within 12 hours they're sailing again, making good time with at least one day's run of over 200 miles. Peter and Connie have read the weather signs correctly 
and for them the doldrums and Azores High scarcely existed, while Charles Heidsick goes too far east and has missed the winds that Flyer and Ceramco have caught at the Azores. Sophisticated modern weather facsimile machines are an invaluable aid in place of the old Morse decoders. They are much easier to use, printing out detailed weather maps giving a clear pattern of the way the weather is developing. But Flyer has finally lost the wind in the last stages of the race, making very slow progress up the Solent against the tide. By dawn, the escort fleet of welcoming boats increases to cheer her on her way to the finish and includes three ships of the Dutch Navy. The crew quickly recover from the harassing experience of running aground in the dark on the Shingles Bank at the entrance to the Solent, confused by the mass of lights. Luckily, they floated off after a few minutes. Dutch television have come to film Connie's arrival in very different conditions from his spectacular progress broaching up the Solent in a Force 9 to win the last race. Connie has achieved his ambition to be first on elapsed time into each port of call. After rounding the outer spit boy, Flyer suddenly comes alive, heeling well over as she points up and sprints for the line off South Sea. Flyer has beaten Great Britain 2's previous record time for the whole voyage by an incredible two weeks and has set new records for the passages to Cape Town, Auckland and Cape Horn. Connie will have to wait another four days for Charles Heidsick to run out of time and know that Flyer has completed a remarkable double and won the overall handicap prize as well. Admiral Charles Williams takes the aft warp and congratulates Connie on behalf of the Royal Naval Sailing Association for having won the greatest race in the world.